Okay, welcome again uh, to the seminar. We are going to begin this table. Uh, I'm going to introduce very quickly uh, the two speakers because we are we have not a lot of time and uh, uh, better we 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 have a, a discussion. Um, uh, welcome and thank you uh, to be here to the Professor uh, Chiska Pau Jimenez from ITAM and to Professor John Forrejon for uh, New York University. Thank you to be here. We are very glad to have you in the National University. Uh, I'm going to give the floor to Professor uh, Chiska. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, the case of Mexico. Um, please. So, uh, as you saw, I think you had the opportunity to see the paper, uh, which is in fact a, a work in progress, very preliminary thing. What I try to do is uh, to recall, just keep in mind the main patterns of constitutional amendment in Mexico, what we call hyper-reformism in this seminar, so as to analyze and discuss, what's this? Okay. So as to analyze some of its effects. So this is not a paper on causes. No, there's, I think, a lot of interesting literature. M many of the things that Zach and Tom have done, and also Negreto no, in Mexico, is work about the causes of constitutional, why people amend, uh, why in other countries it's so difficult, why some countries replace and do not amend. So this is not a thing on causes. It's an exploration about effects, and in particular about the sort of effects that uh, could ground the description of the Mexican constitution as an ineffective constitution. Uh, so in the paper, I try to think about constitutional efficacy or inefficacy in a rather minimalist way, so as not to conflate efficacy with goodness or, you know, like some thicker normative parameter of evaluation of constitutions. Uh, so basically, I take constitutions to be text. Uh, I agree with the reasonable defense that Melkinburg make of taking constitutions as the text and not the constitutional system, for instance. But I do make a functional approach or definition of efficacy, of, of constitutional, of text efficacy. And, um, and I... Uh, I imagine an effective constitution as a constitution that is capable of fulfilling certain important functions that I divide into main groups, uh, legal functions and political functions. And uh, so uh, I imagine the legal function, the core legal function of a constitution as uh, the fact that the constitution gives us um, some basic guidance about what are the rules of recognition, change, and adjudication that are definitional to the legal system as a distinctive system of social motivation. And also as a constitution that provides the means for the implementation or development of its own, let's say, substantive program. No? That I think this is very characteristic of constitutions. Constitutions set out substantive standards that should preside over the regulation of the world, and then they include many things so as to develop this program within very wide margins. You know, it's not uh, an execution like, uh, but that's why I, I speak about development or implementation. And I also use this idea that we can distinguish several levels of implementation mechanisms of a constitution seen as a legal device so you use words no, in the first place to motivate <laughs> people to follow this program. And you use in institutions that you create, legislative, executive, and other branches, and you use the judiciary. And also we can see amendment rules as a way of enforcing the Constitution in the sense that you can you know, change the Constitution instead of going out and bypassing what the Constitution says. In that respect, you use the legal machinery that the Constitution provides. 
another thing that I say very briefly is that uh, when speaking about efficacy, even if I am new to the literature on efficacy, so maybe it's all wrong, but I think in the global south or in, in Latin America, it's very important not to think about constitutional efficacy as, you know, world reality, perfect congruence, precisely because no, we have transformative constitutions, that, the thing that we were talking about at the last session. So the, the, there's not, the Constitution is not supposed to be a mirror of the status quo. The Constitution is supposed to be a program to transform the status quo. So the distance between the text and status quo is normal. It's not, you know, uh, something that we should see as an, an, an anomaly from the start. And I try to suggest the notion of political efficacy thinking that what the Constitution must do for democracy, for democratic policy, politics, is give an organization of the democratic conversation. It should give some map uh, about what are the points of equilibrium between um, minorities and majorities, individual and groups, the past, the present, and the future. Of course, we are all the time discussing what the limits mean or whether, the, whether these points are well uh, establishing the Constitution or not, but we sort of think that the Constitution must give an order to the democratic conversation in that respect, like distinguishing different levels of democratic debate um, in a society. So, uh, before using this very broad framework that I don't know if it's very useful, I'm not an empirics person as, we, as, you, as you know, but I think a problem of this is that it probably is not very useful to miser degrees of efficacy or inefficacy, but we can discuss that later. It's useful for me to make a narrative about things that I uh, think might be uh, symptoms of inefficacy, but we can discuss that later. So, but b b before applying this, just let me recall a little bit some things about, you know, like amendment in Mexico, very quick, everybody, almost everybody knows. As uh, uh, the formal, I mean, as, as to the formal mechanisms, you know that we have no unamendable provisions. I mean, the Constitution permits amendment of everything. You know that section, the, the section 135 formula requires these majorities and the approval of the majority of the states, but mm, it doesn't require actors beyond the ordinary political process. It, 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 uh, the, the veto players are the same that are legislating every day. So it's not very distant. There's not a requirement of referendum. It's a one formula for all. It doesn't distinguish the Mexican Constitution between more important amendments and less important amendments. So, uh, well, third point, there's no explicit provision about judicial review of amendments. That's also from a comparative viewpoint that's also interesting to register. And fourth point, the Supreme Court has foreclosed review of both procedural and substantive regularity of amendments, which is a bit surprising because contrary to the India <laughs> dynamics in which, you know, each other are fighting, you know, amendments, the, the, here you would expect a Supreme Court saying, here am I, like, you know, like, no, and, and no. Probably because of the empowerment that the Supreme Court feels in Mexico through interpretation. That's one of my hypotheses, but we can discuss that later. So the number of amendments, I rely on, you know, the countings that other people have done. We already said that. Uh, there's more than 500, I like 600 section amendments uh, in, the, in the Constitution uh, through uh, people in Mexico used to count amendment decrees and section amendments. And uh, we also know uh, that amendments have increased dramatically in frequency over the last 15 or 20 years, which is in principle surprising from the point of view of, you know, like, because there's more political plurality, so you would expect uh, they should, uh, yeah, exactly. And it is, so the, the, in Mexico it has happened the other way around. More political plurality, more amendments. But as we all know, when we were discussing this all, uh, with the scope uh, discussion now, the quantitative uh, register must be complemented by a qualitative assessment of, you know, the approximate 
uh, amount of change from the point of view of normative consequences. For example, the human rights reform that Al Al Andrea raised already. It's only one section change, but it's, you know, and it, 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 it implies more things that all the human rights amendments that one by one had been added to the Constitution uh, over the last 15 years, which were a lot, you know, that right to food, right to ma many things like added one by one, and this is more consequential than, than, than everything else. These are data from the Casar and Marvan study. It's just, you know, they, but they don't cover the, the amendments in the Peña Nieto period, which are a lot. So, but they, they show that amendments increase. These are the decrease. <coughs> And, and a thing that the Casare Marvan showed uh, in the study is that this is only the tip of the iceberg because the, the amount of amendment uh, bills is, you know, it's like huge. So the thing that we have in the Constitution is just the tip of an iceberg. Up. So this means that, you know, amendment is always on the mind of, of legislators in Mexico. It's, the, the mean? Yeah, this is the, the, the bill. This is a absolute data. I... I I had this from, from other presentations. Proyectos. Ah, presented, presented, approved, rejected, and pendant. This only gives you a sense. It's more than 2,000, you know, uh, and, and it can be presented by the Congress or by the Senate or by the President. So this is the dynamics. We all have a sense. A lot of amendments, hyper-reformism. What are the outcomes? What, what kind of constitution we have after that? Uh, uh, well, we have been commenting some of these things already. We have a very long constitution. I had a wrong count in the paper because the counting had taken the page numbers and the headings. I counted it again and it, with the transitory clauses, it's this. It's not, it's not even, you know, like you have 70,000 70, but if you add the transitory constitutions, and you have to add the transitory constitution, because you have huge <laughs> parts, and, and the home arrest case, I mean, what Supreme Court is, be, is being called to adjudicate now, is be, it's in the transitory constitution. So, it's, so maybe, I don't know if the India is still longer than us, but we are really, you know, uh, on the brink of breaking the, no, the, the Guinness, the, the, being on the book of records. <laughs> So, yeah, and it's much longer now than the Bolivarian constitutions that Zach um, uh, shows as an instance of very long constitutions. It is also extremely detailed. We also know that. The language is, I put technical, but it's not technical. In, it's, un, un, you know, it's, <laughs> I don't know what word to use. It's very difficult to understand. It's not a problem. It's, it's anti-technical. It's technical at the same time. We don't know. Uh, we are con lawyers. And, and we don't understand the Constitution, so it's really hard at some, at some point. It's structurally disorganized, it's heterogeneous, stylistically heterogeneous, and you show a lot of examples about this. This poses a great problem of enforcement, but it's not the same, for instance, judicial adjudication under an abstract Constitution that is all the time abstract, or under a detailed Constitution that is all the time detailed. That in a Constitution that is abstract and detailed, and you know, like, this, it's very difficult, for instance, for judges to construct like coherency out of a constitution that is stylistically very heterogeneous. And of course, normatively heterogeneous. Of course, all constitutions are a bit heterogeneous because they are the product of political negotiation. And of course, they include rights that conflict and structurally. But this is something different. We have blatant contradictions between rules, like determined rules. One says A and the other non-A. We all know that. So that's another degree of internal contradiction. That's the way Hector and Diego describe the problems and give a lot of very interesting examples. Um, so wh what's the problem of this? Um, some of the problems that I said at the level of uh, what I call legal efficacy is that, of course, at the textual level, the Constitution must motivate people. And, and the Mexican Constitution cannot give persons nor public authorities really determinate reasons for action. You know, there's not a, the, the, at this very first level of the legal transmission belt, so to speak, we already have problems. If you have problems at this level, we will have problems at every other level, of course. No? Um, 
At the second level, legislative and executive development, of course, you have uh, misguided constitutional enforcements or developments or partial all the time, especially if you are trying to apply the Constitution at the same time that you are thinking about amend amending it. So it's not really, it's it's not that and uh, that you have like a clear a clear um, picture of, of of if you are a legislator or an executive uh, the, of what is the program that must be you know kind of trickled down through legislation. At the third level, the judiciary, the, the problems with the judiciary are especially serious, I would say, because the judiciary is trapped in a circle of inefficacy. With, because in great part to this very disorganized and very incoherent constitution. The, the, the judiciary must give some messages of what are the points of unity of the legal system. And uh, as our long discussion, for instance, on the Bill of Rights no, in the Supreme Court shows, uh, in Mexico, it's not that we are discussing what the Bill of Rights requires or what the Bill of Rights means, but we are discussing what is the Bill of Rights. You know, and you have the Supreme Court with a, in, a, in a country with no access to justice discussing technically about the boundaries of the Bill of Rights part of the Constitution. Why? Because of these contradictions that I say that you have a treaty that has, uh, is, is at the same hierarchical level that says uh, Prisoners should ca could have uh, political votes restricted, but only restricted. And, and you have the Mexican traditional constitution saying uh, not only pe people condemned, but you know, uh, against the presumption of innocence, which is another part of the constitution, you will deny absolutely all political rights to people on the, on the, on the process. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so wh what is the real constitution? of rights, what is the Bill of Rights? Is this one or the, so you have a lot of problems at the level of pre-interpretative stage, to, to, to call it in Dworkinian terms. So th this creates, I don't know, uh, like a complete uh, craziness in the, what I call the legal uh, unfolding of the, of the system. At the fourth level, this is, I, I haven't thought this that much, it seems that amendment rules have are more useful than others. <laughs> a more efficacy as a level of, uh, uh, within the legal machinery be because they are used uh, more. But I think I, I have to think more about what happens with the amendment rule itself as a piece of legal machinery. So the problem is, in the end, that I think the Constitution is a failure as the center of the Mexican legal system. Uh, and I think law, it's not really constraining. I mean, the, the degree to which law is constraining is vari variable. And we want, for instance, rights that have the form of principle to not be as constraining as rules. And you know, we have different legal forms and we, he we, we plan different degrees of constraint. But the problem is that because of the way the constitution is designed now and what, what it, I don't think it constrains at all. So I think this is a, a disappearance, in a way, of the legal system as a distinctive system of social regulation, distinctive from other normative systems that we have out there, religion, narco, whatever. So uh, th this is, and, and all this in the paper, I really want, uh, this is very disorganized in the paper. So th this is really like uh, just exploratory, and I have to to, to or organize more all these all these analyses, but let's turn to the political side. Um, we have also a lot of inefficacies from the perspective of this uh, idea that the constitution must be given an order or an organization to democratic uh, debate. So, uh, well, first, and this is. Uh, well, this is, I, I was recalling the, the discussion in the last panel about uh, uh, you have some difference between amending or, or having a new constitution. First, uh, if, if in Mexico, the, the first political cost of amending incrementally and not never replacing the constitution is that, of course, you don't have a process of, you know, 
high ally making, I don't know, from the point of view of the democratic genesis, you, you lose a lot from the perspective of democracy. Because these, these, I mean, these amendments are discussed within the framework of ordinary politics. Of course, if ordinary politics is wow, that's not a problem. But if ordinary politics is democratically very poor, and you have 100 years without saying to people, let's go to the mountain and let's discuss how, you know. So, th so that's, that's the first uh, policy that maybe it's not here, but uh, I want to, to underline that. See, that's a very high political cost for a society. Uh, the elites, you know, the elites doing the thing and not like really us. <laughs> uh, second, uh, of course, I think if you have such a chaotic constitution that really does not mark what, what, what we should be discussing in terms of rights or in terms of uh, entrenched things and non-entrenched things, you lose the benefits of the, divi of the division of labor, that constitutionalism, pro that stability in constitutionalism provides. No? Everything is up for grabs all the time in Mexico. And so we don't have the time to center on a few issues and discuss them with depth. So that's that why I, well, I, I use your frameworks in the endurance about no, the pros and cons of stability from a, 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 a political point of view. And, and I think these benefits are foregone now in Mexico. Second, state institutions are over empowered because legal forms are not constraining, see? So that's why the Mexican Supreme Court has refused to review the constitutionality of constitutional amendments. Because the, the Supreme Court can do everything through interpretation. <laughs> so that's, that, that it's, and he and she eat the court, eat. <laughs> and, and it doesn't have to, you know, like struggle politically. Because if you, if you like the Supreme Court of India, if you are reviewing the constitutionality of amendments, you, that's, they don't need to, to do that. They just interpret whatever they want. Because almost everything can be presented as an interpretation of the Constitution. The same for the legislator, in fact, even if, of course, you can have a dialogue about that in the, in, the, in the judicial arena. Accountability demands are very difficult to articulate. How are you going to say, look, this is wrong, if you don't have, if you have so much difficulties as a citizen, as an academic, to construct uh, you know, a critical basis uh, on, the, on the basis of what the constitutional text says. Uh, third point, the potentially, or fourth, the potentially democratic reinforcing effects of judicial intervention are also damaged. Impossibility to adjudicate under the requirements of integrity. As you know, like you, you have in, in your work many times uh, raised, judicial review can be democracy reinforcing in the sense that you uh, oblique majorities to pause and to deliberate more on certain things. But if you have judicial review on the, ba on the basis of this sort of constitution, really, you, you, then, you, you don't have judges um, articulating as we want in these theories that try to counteract the counter-majoritarian difficulty, judges articulating like the basic values and all this, <laughs> because we all know that's a bit arbitrary, you know, what the, what the Supreme Court makes out of the constitutional text. So th this is empowering for democracy. Uh, and also the potentially democratic reinforcing effects of amendment as a means to respond to judges that we don't have that practice. But if we had that, yeah, it's only like one, one more minute. Uh, I think it would also be damaged because imagine, imagine that the Supreme Court starts to review the constitutionality of, of constitutional amendments. Well, in fact, this dialogue will be as chaotic as everything else. And when legislators in function of amending power respond, in fact, they can put another piece in the text of the constitution, but you know, they are not, I mean, the, the, the judges will, can insist and present another combination of textual elements. And so it happens the same that in the judicial, ordinary judicial review level. And then, well, there's other effects that are more symbolic and indirect, but um, 
I think that if we think that the Constitution must be something that reflects the, uh, an idea of the kind of society we want to be, for instance, there's a lot of possible indirect effects, but just to pick up one or two. Uh, then it's terrible, no? Because the image that the Constitution gives of us as a polity, as a democratic polity, it's horrible. You know, like we, we all know Mexicans, we are Baroque, yes, but one thing is to be Baroque, but we have, <laughs> you have this, <laughs> we have also these wonderful architects that are not Baroque, you know, like we have both. It's yeah, not that, yeah. Go, go. <laughs> But, but we also have, exactly. <laughs> um, so um, if, if, if this gives a, an image of what we are, that's terrible. And well, another, I didn't say that on the paper, but I was thinking about this. Of course, the, the Constitution has the indirect political effect of uh, allowing the politicians to do democratic politics on the basis of basically what they want. Instead, it's not that it's not it, the, it doesn't have effects. It's that the effects that it has at the political level are not the effects that are intended. In the first place, because we don't really know what effects are intended. But, but basically, uh, the Constitution as it now um, uh, uh, is, allows politicians of, you know, continually negotiate and change the, con and change the Constitution instead of enforcing the Constitution, instead of, you know, it destroys, it destroys the dynamics of the rule of law, which basically demands that people stay, and that, that, the peop, that authorities don't change the rules they are supposed to be, uh, see? So, conclusion, two minutes. Uh, as, you say, as you can see, my vision is very pessimistic. And I don't like that because I'm not this kind of guy that says, you know, like Latin American constitutionalism is a failure, Latin America is a chaos. I'm not that kind of person. I love what happens in Latin America's region, but here am I, you know, like with this. <laughs> but um, note, please, that Mexico is the only country <laughs> in Latin America, not, I, don't, I don't know if the only one, but that hasn't transitioned to democracy without enacting a new constitution. And so I, I do think that this Mexican beat for incrementalism and gradualism and I think we are, this strategy is reaching the limits, you know, it, it's not, um, so um, I don't know, I think uh, I have reasons to be as, uh, oh, oh, my, my diagnostic is not, b because that's a bit of, a, of an anomaly. The Mexican people, the people has, didn't have the opportunity to really think about what kind of 21st century democracy that they want to be. So, uh, well, mm, we can discuss that uh, later, of course, because we don't know the alternatives, the realistic alternatives uh, are not many. Uh, but I would think, I would say, you know, we have the, I mean, we are Global South like champions, but <laughs> Mexico is still an exception and we have to be very, very, very critical with the constitution we have because it really impedes, I think, the, the, the evolution of the country in terms of rule of law and a more rich democratic um, dynamics. So that's it. Thank you so much. Um, now I'm going to give the floor to the Professor Ferrejan to uh, make the comment of the presentation of uh, Dr. Roa Chiska. I feel like I'm a person who's been blind from birth listening to someone describe an elephant and asked to offer suggestions. <laughs> so uh, take take my comments uh, with a grain of salt. Um, I have a couple of um, a, a criticisms which are going to keep coming up. So I'll just say that one in particular, <clears throat> that you say that you're, you put aside the explanatory project, you know, and giving it to Tom and Zach. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can do that, you know, and the reason is because the deepest puzzle is the one that Pasquale mentioned last time, which is, as far as I can see, you know, there was a break in the 1980s in Mexico, the transition, you know, and, and what was generating amendments before the break, whenever you draw the line, seems not too hard to understand. I mean, you had a party with a constitutional majority. They could decide to put bits of legal code in the Constitution. They, got the, they had a majority, no problem, you know. So, so, but after the 80s, it's not so clear that anybody has a majority. So then you have all these amendments 
accelerating, exploding. Hmm. And, you know, so, you know, these amendments, let's say for the moment they have effect somehow. Uh, the question is, why is everybody voting for them? You know, I mean, there's no majority. I mean, there's no clear majority, no constitutional majority, according to the amendment rules. So people are voting for them. Why are they doing that? You know, so that's the biggest puzzle. And we don't have an answer to that. Right. So, so, and that, you, that runs right through the paper. It runs through your pessimism. You know, it runs through who you blame for this. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that's the, the, the big question that I'll keep coming back to. Um, secondly, I'll complain about another thing, which is you don't have access to this complaint. She said, I, Andrea sent me an earlier version of the paper. And it had a section, not just on hyper reformism as an abstract phenomenon, the explosion of amendments, but also in another aspect, which was the creation of lots of separate agencies, which are independent in lots of ways, proliferation of them. You know, I think that's an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can talk about it here because not everybody's read this, but it's a very it's interesting phenomenon. Paper, yeah, yeah but, it, but it is an aspect of hyper reformism because it's one thing you do, but it has, you know, it's a, it's a specific set of effects of breaking up the executive and possibly judicial functions and maybe even legislative functions. Mm -hmm. And so there's a prol proliferation of powers, which is a very interesting phenomenon. So I just complain about the fact that you didn't put it here. <laughs> so okay. if you want to talk about it later, it's good. So, okay, so I like your analysis of efficacy. I won't criticize that. So, um, so I, I don't agree. Okay, so I do agree that there's no doctrine, as there is not in the United States, of unconstitutional constitutional amendments. You know, but judges have a job. <laughs> They have to decide what the law is in order to apply it. Mm -hmm. So when they have contradictions, and you stipulate they have contradictions in the Constitution, they have to resolve the uh, con you know, the contradiction to do something, either to throw out the case even. They have to say, you have no right here, <laughs> you know, because it's trumped by some other right. So, so it's, it's, it has to be ubiquitous, the blind man says to the person describing the elephant. There's contradictions all over the place. The judges are at least sometimes applying the law, as they are in the example you give, which I'll talk about. And so they have to do it, you know. So, mm -hmm. so that's implicitly a doctrine. Now, nobody, in the United States, we refuse to call it a doctrine of unconstitutional constitutional amendments. We do it interpretively, just like they do in Mexico. You know, I mean, the most famous case that I know is one that cuts close to my heart, which is in the 21st Amendment, when they repealed the prohibition, you know. So, so but then they put a bunch of stuff in the 21st Amendment that appears to directly, doesn't appear to, it directly contradicts the Commerce Clause. It permits individual states to erect trade barriers between the states. They're directly against the Commerce Clause. So the question is, you know, how can they do that? Now, of course, it's an amendment, so of course they could do it. This means that you cannot ship wine into Massachusetts. And, you know, I don't live in Massachusetts, but I've, people, in, people in Pennsylvania, you cannot ship wine into Pennsylvania. People leave Pennsylvania to go to New Jersey and teach because they can't buy wine in Pennsylvania. So this is a very important amendment. It's kind of, so, so again, you know, there's some, some famous cases where the, the court had, here's a wine grower himself. Right? So, exactly. Right? So, so, so the point is that, you know, here's an important amendment where the court had to decide, you know, was this constitutional amendment, the 21st Amendment, which is extremely popular, incidentally, for pe by people like me, you know, valid as written, you know, so, so they had to do this and they didn't call it unconstitutional as such and dismiss it. They did it interpretively, which they would do in Mexico. Um, I didn't agree how they came out because <laughs> you know, they should have said, you can't do this, but they didn't do that. So, so I think they do, they must do this yeah, effectively. Yeah. So, so I think you're overstayed a little bit. Okay. So let me go to the next part, which is, I, she has a long criticism of hyper reformism as such. And I agree with all of it, I think in terms of analysis, but but then there's, so we're at a juncture where something could be done, possibly, or should be done, maybe could be done. And as far as I see it, there's three things that could be done. One is replace the Constitution. Uh, that may be politically difficult, impossible, whatever. Another is to play a trick, like the UNAM thing, that is, you know, don't actually replace it, but segregate out some parts of it as, as organic law. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe have different procedures for dealing with it as they do in some places. And maybe that would work. I don't know. The third way is judicial reconstruction. Make a new constitution judicially. You know, now that seems really easy. <laughs> I mean, as far as, you know, all you need, a ju you need judges with cojones, you know, but, but you, need, you need judges to say, okay, you know, what is a bit, now, because cause here you have this pathology, on, I would say on the political side. You've got these people voting for tons of amendments where they must, there must be opposition and yet they're approving them anyway. So that's where the craziness is. So now why won't, why aren't there judges that say, Let's see what a constitution should look like, and let's start enforcing that. And announce principles, doctrinal principles, which regulate, 
you know, how to resolve some of these contradictions. So, for example, look at the 2011 amendment. You know, it says, we recognize these treaties to which Mexico is a signatory, you know, creating human rights, even though they conflict with, knowing they conflict with some constitutional provisions. We put them at the same hierarchical level. And then you have this battle, which you described briefly in the paper, between different judges, you know. But nevertheless, the judges somehow have to apply come to an understanding of what's required in a specific case, in specific cases. So it seems to me that judges could, you know, begin to use the interpretive tools they have to begin crafting a constitution. Now, the reason for doing it is not that it will necessarily stick. It's the reason for doing it is to move the legal status quo to a situation where the politicians are focused on the legal status quo. That is to say, if the judges actually do this, the Constitution says the, the, the politicians have two ways to respond. One is incrementally by amendments. But if the judges set up a process in which they say, look, you can send us all the amendments you want. We're going to interpret them broadly or narrowly in terms of whether they fit with our vision. Then the politicians are, are being told, essentially, if you want to change this whole thing, think seriously either about a new constitution or about the UNAM you, you know, type proposal where you rearrange the constitutional elements. You know, there's, put have judges suggest that judges play the role of shifting the status quo such that political leaders are forced to confront a new reality they either like and they just go along with or they don't like and they are motivated to change in a way that's actually productive. So, and I would say it would take a judge like uh, Barack in Israel, mm -hmm. it would take a, you know, a judge, a John Marshall, you know, we you need, need this guy. You need this, you need this guy. <laughs> now, I, and I'm, and I'm not opposed to. I am not opposed to democracy. This is not anti-democratic. It's, it's to say, if you democratically want to change things, then you have to mm -hmm. okay. focus on what would be the alternative. Mm -hmm. You know. So, now you don't endorse that. I'm not putting it in your mouth, but it strikes me that the conjuncture looks like it might be ripe for this. You know. So I just think it might be worth talking about. So, okay. so, um, some other listen. Uh, Okay, so I think this may help deal with uh, what I would call the political pathology of hyperformism is that things that people as political leaders ought to oppose because it entrenches on things they care about. They don't oppose, they go along with it and produce amendments that shouldn't be, there shouldn't be. So it may change that process in some way. If they see the judges are actually going to enforce some features in ways that may be objectionable to them, they may take be more serious about saying, "Well, well maybe we shouldn't enact this as an amendment." Mm -hmm. So, so, okay. So that, let's stop with that. But that's that's kind of the idea that your paper provoked in me, right? So, um, so so part of it is to say. Uh, so I want to say one thing about India, because India, you know, they invented this idea of an un, unmodifiable part of the constitution schedule. What was it called? It, whatever the schedule was. It's a name, you know, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but it's part. And that, but this was done in the presence of pre. <laughs> it wasn't done in the presence of, you know, Nieta. <laughs> it was pre. It was the. It was facing a party with a constitutional majority, and Indira Gandhi's party were sending over constitutional measures. They could they could print off a mimeograph. You just send them off. You send them to the parliament. They immediately rat ratify them. So they invented the, the Supreme Court, which seemed to have a John Marshall. <laughs> or somebody, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who said, no, 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 you can't amend this. I don't care how many people you vote for it. Mm -hmm. This part is staying right here. Change the whole constitution if you don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. Right, so I, I just want to say the India example is not an example that's relevant to today. It's relevant to what happened before the 1980s. Right, so, so I'm not saying they couldn't do this. I'm just saying that India has to be understood in this different way. And it doesn't seem to be in the discussion mm -hmm. understood that way. So, um, so let's see. Uh, uh, well, okay, so I want to say a, another couple things about culture because it was on the table from, you know, earlier discussions today, and I think there may be something to it, but I don't, I don't, I, I'm hesitant to make the move to culture too quickly. So when Tom Ginsburg talked about it, he talked about culture in an undifferentiated way, but he could mean that there's a distinctive, let's say, Mexican political constitutional culture which says a men don't change, you know, and... Uh, which could be described as a culture, but I would say maybe it could be described in a way that's not cultural, which is as a kind of equilibrium. So, and I'm not sure this is true, but it's a conjecture. So it would go like this. It would say, the culture says, you know, uh, this, I mean, this equilibrium says, well, we can make amendments, you know, to the Constitution because, you know, we know we're putting them in front of the courts and other enforcers, and 
they won't have that many effects because the courts are timid or something, whatever reason. So we're free to do that. So the courts understand this, and they understand that in this equilibrium, we should not be too aggressive about enforcing things and being like John Marshall, right? Right. So then, um, so then, but occasionally, if and, and if they if they decide to be aggressive, like like they might have in the Pacheco case, you know, decided to be aggressive, then there'll be a reaction, you know. So so the equilibrium is enforced by you know you know if there's a, a political reaction against doing stuff. So, so it's kind of an equilibrium. Now, if it's an equilibrium, it looks a little different than a culture. A culture has a slow-moving, semi-rational, maybe even an irrational aspect to it. You know, it's driven by emotional attachment. But equilibrium is, is, is supported by some kinds of rationality calculation. So in principle, if you describe something as an equilibrium, if it's accurately described as an equilibrium, then in principle, there's ways to think about changing some feature of it in some way such that you move to a different equilibrium. And that may be a more productive metaphor than the um, culture metaphor. And I, I'm not sure that it's the better metaphor, but it's, it seems like it might be a way to think about some of the patterns. Like, should we think in Mexico that there's this kind of, you know, uh, interaction between the way judges decide things and politicians enact things, both constitutionally and ordinary laws? And if we think of it as an equilibrium relation, could we find a way to disturb it in a way that could be productive, which is what I'm mm. suggesting. So. So that's kind of the ideas that your paper provokes. I think it was a really interesting description, um, and I really liked it. I o only wish you'd also describe this feature of fragmenting executive and judicial powers with these independent things which provoke other thoughts, which I don't want to develop here because it wouldn't be fair. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes for questions and comments. Pablo, por favor, adelante. But I think has implications on your argument. I, that you have the idea that you said that your conception, your conception of the functions that the, the Constitution has to perform is minimalist. I don't, I don't think it is minimalist at all. I think it is really substantive. Maybe you, could, but you could say is, it is robust, but it's not formalistic. Maybe the, the position is not only formalistic, it's, it's substantive, mm -hmm. but it's, it's rather robust. But even though it is robust, I think it is incomplete. Because you, you, you point out two main functions, the legal and the political. But that thing, I think there is one lacking, the constitutional. And I don't want to, to sound like old-fashioned, but just remember Madison. I mean, the Madison idea that one thing that the Constitution has to do is to empower the government to control population. And two, second, control itself. itself. That, that's, that's not the, the legal nor the political that you are pointing out. And, and I think it's central. Mm -hmm. It's very important to, for a constitution to be efficient or to be efficacious to perform that function. Because it make, and it makes your argument even more complex and, and the causes of, or maybe the consequence of inefficacy more complex. Because if you consider the four levels of inefficacy that you have that describe the textual, legislative, and executive, etc. If you consider the way in which this empowering different institutions of the state and different uh, areas of government, branches of government, and different levels of government, and at the same time the ways in which you design the control, the check and balances mechanisms between uh, the, the, these uh, different branches of government and levels of government, well, the problem of inefficacy becomes really really, really, not Baroque, but really complex. Uh, and I think, I, well, I won't go into Baroque. It really makes things very complicated, and, and the estimates of inefficacy are multiple. Then you realize that the, the inefficacy can really comes from almost any square of the r different aspects of regular mm -hmm. uh, constitutional life in Mexico, mm -hmm. no, of, of the just very inertia of the constitutional di dynamics in Mexico. And it makes you being less pessimist that you are, because you are maybe lacking the whole picture of the thing. Mm -hmm. Mexico is inefficacious, inefficacious. The Mexican constitutional system is inefficacious in the legal level, in the political level, but mostly in the constitutional level. Mm -hmm. We have a very inefficacious government. Mm -hmm. And the causes of that are substantially constitutional causes, because we cannot do almost anything out of governmental impulse in Mexico. Mm -hmm. 
And I have just two different and very different examples. One is the, the El Acuerdo Nacional sobre Salud Alimentaria. That has to do with the, it's a national agreement on uh, uh, health, uh, aliment, uh, no, food health, or uh, I don't know, whatever. Food, food, safety. food health, or safety. Uh, safety. not safety, it has to be too about health. I mean, it has to be with the problem of obesity, and particularly oh, with the, uh, the causes of, of diabetes, uh, the public health problem. It was impossible to enact any kind of legislative or executive resolution on this topic because the government knew that whatever they do, it would be challenged in, the court, in courts and the, the, the constituency or the stakeholders would block any kind of executive or legislative uh, project on policy on this. So the only thing they, are, they come to, they, they, they got to get, was an agreement that has no substantial. So we still, st still face a very serious problem of public health and nutrition. Mm -hmm. And nutrition is the term of nutrition in, 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 in Mexico, because we couldn't do anything mm -hmm. about it. The other example is the, is the Mexico City airport. We won't have a new airport, yet. that's bad news. We won't have it, because we cannot exercise eminent domain in Mexico. Mm -hmm. There is no eminent domain in reality in Mexico. Mm -hmm. there is, it's in the Constitution, it's Article 27, <coughs> it's in all kind of, but no public infrastructure can be developed out of the problem of in, in, in the incapacity of the state to exercise eminent domain. These seem to be two different areas that show that there are substantial constitutional blocks in the regular <coughs> going on of government in Mexico that impede efficacious government. That seems to be relevant for, for constitutional dynamics. Well, very uh, uh, mm, briefly, uh, I think we will have the opportunity this afternoon to discuss the three options that John was um, uh, presented. It's interesting. I, I want to make only an observation. It seems to me that mm, you have an idea of why mm, the Congress, if it's called Congress, in the last 15, 20 years continued that increased the number of constitutional amendments. You said, which is true, Mexico is the only Latin American country moving, so to speak, to democratic order without changing the Constitution. That's true. But you added something. You said politicians do not respect the Constitution, they change it. Th this is interesting. I don't know evidently if it's true, but, but yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not local. <laughs> but I mean, I'm, th this is apparently your theory. So it's not true that you don't have an explanation. You have the explanation that they prefer to rather than to write a constitution, which is a significant mm -hmm. transformation, to put in the constitution some provisional agreement be, without changing it. Okay, I stop here. But I mean, it seems that you have something to say. I don't know if you're right or not, but. Well, just really quickly, um, it seems to me a lot of these issues that we're going to talk about right now will also turn to this afternoon, too. So I just wanted to plant some of the same ideas that concern me with the whole project. It seems like um, your paper, Chisca, is in, in service of this larger consolidation uh, project. So it seems like there's an ITAM UNAM uh, coalition here. And just a couple ideas uh, that strike me about this. One is that, um, I mean, Pablo was talking about some areas where it really matters, like in terms of nutrition and eminent domain, that something's not working. I didn't necessarily get that from your paper. It wasn't clear to me. I mean, somebody could be, I mean, we're all into organization, and some people are more type A than others, and we all like to have things orderly in our constitution. But it wasn't clear to me what the rub is, like where it actually matters in terms of um, outcomes. And so I think it would be interesting to hear about more about that. Uh, a second thing um, that I'd be very curious about is to hear from you about, if you know, about why these things are happening. Because in, in terms of, um, let's say, the misorganization of the text after years of incremental 
accumulation of changes. Um, you would think that you know you would address the problem by thinking about how this happens. I, you know, when I think about uh, legislation and, and and how it happens, it's a legislator who basically goes to the legal counsel and says, "I want a law on X," or "I want a constitutional constitutional amendment on X." And then the legal counsel staff has to draft that up and draw it up. And it seems like they, in that process, there's something going wrong, right? They're not taking into account how it's inconsistent with another part of the Constitution, that sort of thing. So it seems like, you know, yeah, we can step back and reorganize the Constitution, but why isn't it happening at that legal counsel, that drafting step? Okay, and then this third thing, I'm just curious, uh, because I'm not a lawyer, and uh, I always ask Tom to answer these questions, but maybe we've got a room full of lawyers now. But, but just apart from the Constitution, you know, we've had years and years, 200 years of law, whether it's municipal law or state law or national law. It seems like there's always a the accumulation of laws that we have to deal with. And, you know, so there's always this organizational issue of all these laws that people keep writing that we're supposed to abide by. What, what, is there some mechanism, like, at the, at the level of ordinary law to deal with the organization of laws and systematizing them? I'm just curious. I don't know. Maybe someone has the answer. Okay. I think with this... In England, they still have laws from the Middle Ages. They mm -hmm. never systematize. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Do you want to, con to answer sí, this? No, three, otherwise, I will forget everything. Yes, and it's like... And then we... See? See, no, well, starting for the, with the last things, well, that's part of the problem because the, the legislature has uh, no technical support of the kind we would require. The, the, you know, the legislative in, yeah, the legislative in here have, you know, like single, like, uh, uh, ads, ads that, uh, you know, uh huh, and, and so if you had like all these, um, preventions that, you know, like having somebody studying the possible impact of the amendment or something, uh, doing the second thing that you mentioned, um, trying to figure out the accumulation of things, what, but, but we don't have this thing in Mexico, basically because, and this is related to some of the things that you said, because it's not politically interesting and I, I don't know how to say it it's not uh, there's not a demand for that that they, they the politicians amend the constitution with impunity because impunity is the mexican story you know what i mean it's like you you need a very technical staff to do things better but you actually don't have the staff and it well that's the way mexican presidentialism works and every six years all these ads go home as in the United States, and new ones come and they don't have a, a, any idea about a legislative technique or amendment technique. So that's a problem. So, yes, I have an explanation. Even I, I'm not, <laughs> I, I didn't want to do the paper on causes, but, yeah. but I think what, what happens is that all this system gives politicians political reddits, or has given up to now a lot of political reddits to politicians. So. The, the, um, how is it that despite all the majorities that you need, despite of the fact that you need half of state legislatures mm -hmm. and you don't have the pre anymore, yeah. mm -hmm. you have all this yeah. amendment machinery right. because you use the uh, political process of amendment to negotiate everything yeah. from budget to who will be the judge in the court of, of the Supreme yeah. Court or in the states. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the political efficacy or, and the, the, the efficacy, yeah. it actually, but it's not the intended, you know, or it's not, it's not functional, but this, the, these are the effects. I mean, th this is, or maybe there's an equilibrium in this mm -hmm. that you, we have to, because, because you know, um, the politicians have used constitutional amendment to, we, we, we have been commenting that previously in Mexico, no? when, when we were like, uh, to, to have political gains in the short term, you know? Mm -hmm. Because they negotiate with the others and, the, and if you add rights, for instance, people say, oh wow, look at all these wonderful rights that we have here. And they have had up to now because of judicial deference, but that may be, that should change. Maybe it could change. They had almost no costs, mm -hmm. you know, because, there was not supervision of the coherence and there was not enforcement of all these rights against the government. 
So that, that's my, in the theory of the causes, I think this is what happens. So things can change if judges start to enforce the constitution more, the rights constitution, let's imagine, against the politicians. And so you say so it's, it's a, a pure politics, it's not constitutional politics. That's what it's you're... pure politics, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, f by using the constitution as you can use right, right, right. other things. Yeah. But wh what's the problem, I think, with judicial enforcement? Mm. I mean, uh, judges should, you know, like, mm, try to, to provoke a change, uh, a change of, of by, by doing what they have not been doing, but... And, and, and so, and, th and this, this is connected to your, to your third way of, yeah. you know, of mm. trying, can we replace, can we like reorganize mm. or can we judicially reconstruct the constitution? Mm. Mm. First, an empirical concern. Mm -hmm. You can do that if the, if, the, if the court is united, not divided, if the court is prestigious. Mm. And I, thi I think you need uh, uh, preconditions that we don't have. That's why, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the court, now we are doing that. We are trying to judicially reconstruct the constitution. We are not replacing uh, and we are not officially reordering only in the etunam, no? Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> 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 but the, 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 the reason why this is ineffective is first that the court is divided and the reconstruction doesn't work without, you know, like a Barack kind of judge yeah. that we don't know, <clears throat> yeah? And he's unemployed um, now. sorry, he's unemployed now. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you can't <try> <laughs> uh, but um, but second, second, uh, even if you had a Barack and then you know and a few women <laughs> sitting in the Supreme Court, if you have a, a constitutional text mm -hmm. with that long, th that's part of the problem. How do you reconstruct a constitutional ethos? With, with, with a constitution with the triple times the, 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 the Equatorian. You know what I mean? It's like judicially, this might be, you know, all Hercules judges, you know, and, 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 and it, so that's a problem that why this, this is going to be, I think, in effect, like intrinsically ineffective with the kind of constitution you have. Mm -hmm. So that Zach, uh, this is the discussion this evening, but I'm not sure, I, I believe that we can advance that much through the reordering. Y you know, I'm more pessimistic. Well, we'll I think we need, we need a revolution. We need, <laughs> we need a... <laughs> you know, I, why? Because, I, I mean, this is only like theory. It's not that, this is a, something that can help. But we are elites again, you know? Mm -hmm. Like we are trying to, to put the constitution together as, as always, you know, like elite. No, we need the, the people in here. You know what I mean? Because even if your the outcomes may be like better or even great, you don't have the political process that leads to, you know, to something that we will feel it's our constitution and it's so so that's um I don't know if there's other points. I, I don't remember everything. Well, I don't have a question, but because you know, yes, yeah, a comment. You know, we we share a lot of the things you say, but uh, I have like an hypo a, a hypothesis. Um, maybe turning on the political configuration that we talked before, uh, I think we have a problem with the constitutional concept. I mean, the supremacy of the constitution. And in two parts of that. In the first uh, part, we don't have the control of the constitution uh, to the government. Uh, as you say, we have like an elitist government and the Supreme Court is part of that. For that reason, the Supreme Court, I think, uh, is not um, doing his job of control the government or to uh, limit the government. So the government changed the constitution, the Supreme Court say, okay, it's okay. Um, and, and like this, you have an, an, a coalition uh, between the three branches and as, 
I I am not a Mexican person, so it's difficult to say, but I think it's like an authoritarian coalition in the government. In, uh, yeah. And and if you see this and you compare with, for example, the Andes constitutionalism, you see uh, another pathology in democracy that's a populism uh, configuration of power that is very different to an authoritarian coalition. And and here I, I, I go to the, the other part of the supremacy in uh, not not in uh, in in not in in terms of control but it's in terms of adherence from the people to the constitution so here you have like the this uh, continuity in reforms in amendment that uh, makes impossible the adherence uh, of the people so maybe we need more um uh, I lost the word more um, sorry uh, in Spanish the aspirationales yes aspirational uh, uh, in in constitutions maybe that's way we can uh, find some adherence from the people that we don't have here and it's impossible to have because people don't know the constitution so maybe you can explain this one only one constitution because people have some adherence to the revolutionary one the ones in uh, in the 19th century and no here no now so maybe that that can explain we don't have a maybe we don't have to think about a, an amendment culture but maybe if we have a constitutional culture i think that is <laughs> maybe the the thing we have to to think about, and that is what my comments are. I, I, I so just, um, about, is, is, is briefly, so I do think you are very pessimistic, to say the truth. Um, I, I, I mainly agree with everything, like, not with everything, but with most of what you say. But I, I think, um, so the way I see it is, we know uh, that the Constitution is ill, but we don't know exactly what's the illness and how serious it is. So it seems to me that, and I like that very much about your paper, and I would like you to develop this more in, in further papers, that we have different symptoms, or different, uh, different types of inefficacies, and they are not equivalent, they are not the same. I think some, uh, it's not the same to be very long and disorganized than be, that to be incoherent. And I think uh, it will be extremely interesting to try to look at the different types of problems the Constitution has, I mean, the, the consequences uh, that the Constitution has had, and, and to organize these consequences by type and, and think, because the consequence is, is it, uh, I, I think that the most serious one is the inconsistencies. Um, the length, I think, can be kind of solved. Uh, I think there are a lot of the epistemic, the, 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 the epistemic problems of just getting to know the Constitution that could, could be kind of solved. But there are other problems that are more serious. So, um, and then I think we, we need a diagnosis, a more finely grained diagnosis of exactly uh, where, where, where we are. Because, and these, uh, you don't know, but we are in between like a, a very large uh, discussion on the Constitution. There are a lot of people that, uh, as Chiska says, think that we need to just get a new Constitution. There, Hector and, and Diego has another have other possibilities, uh, and actually there there have been several other op op uh, options. So I I think in, in some I, I would like to say that that I think um, it will be extremely we need what John said, we need to understand the cause, because if we don't get the cause, and we get to a, reor a reorganized constitution and we don't tackle the cause, then we will get in the same process again. So we need to get the cause, and we need to make a diagnosis of, of exactly what are the problems and how they can be solved. And, uh, and, very, and, and just, um, well, that's the other things I want to say, I can say it later. Just a very, very small note. I do think that uh, that is paradoxical that the Supreme Court 
uh, says that she doesn't want to rule on the, on, on the constitutionality of constitutional content because, and this is a, a, a cause of, of, incohe of the incoherence you, you point out, they actually do. I mean, uh, the Yucatan case is actually deciding which of, of the two is consi constitutional. So I think uh, in that sense, uh, John is completely right. And, uh, but I'm not so sure that what you say that this, this actually empowers the, the judiciary because I think it limits it a lot. It limits its possibility of development of task. It, it, it you know, and 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 if you see what they have done, and the judicial deference that there is, you if it, I don't think it's so empowered as I, I think there are a lot of limitations on the on the judiciary, and while they can abstractly decide, some you could say that in. in a priori, you could say, well, yeah, they can decide because you have a lot of different content, and so you can pick whatever you want. Um, at the end, I think also that they cannot construe, and and they uh, and this gets uh, a dynamic within the court that divides them a lot, and that makes it very different, difficult to take decisions. And so, what we have seen is not an overpowered judiciary. What we see is a, a judiciary that. Uh, has had a very difficult time to as to uh, ascertain itself. I think uh, as a uh, Supreme Court. I, I I don't see like these uh, complete like you know these courts that are doing taking complete uh, radical decisions. I, I wouldn't agree that the, that the worst illness of our constitution is inconsistency. I think that the worst illness of our constitution is the way it motivates for, it's, just, it's not just that the rules of the game are wrong, it's, that, it's just that they, in, they make actors to play wrongly. I mean, they make bad players. And That's they, what I, they, the, they, the legal they, inefficacies are supposed to be this. Yeah, yeah yes, but I, they make bad players in the constitutional domain. Uh -huh. I mean, the example, the, the best example for this is the creation of, of autonomous constitutional bodies. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea was that we were going to play with a new te constitutional technique, mm -hmm. and we will have, have a constitutional function of independency, control, at the same time we will have very technical autonomy, but at the end of the day, what we did, or what they did in the constitutional amendments last year, and the, these famous structural reforms, is that they created very inefficacious bodies that just blow the political, the, the, the public policy into the communication and competition. And what we have now is... What about the, the electoral commission? I wouldn't talk about it because I, I don't know anything about electoral law. Uh, but I think that, that would be more or less the same example. No. But I, I'm, I don't really know uh, about uh, electoral, the, the electoral uh, domain. That's but a very important point in democracy. It's but probably I, the most important thing. Well, I, 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 I wouldn't... Uh, that's part, that's part of our disagreement, maybe. But uh, the, the example that would, would be that, I mean, this is very constitu it's constitutional regular, it's a regular constitutional change that made, that, that provoked, or at least is, is making more problem, very inefficient suboptimal equilibria. Mm -hmm. But that is, that can, that we can uh, more or less predict that is going to be even worse. I mean, the equilibria that are going to be happening in the, in the following years are going to be decremental. And we can expect that yeah. partially because we open new uh, sources of constitutional debate. Now the incumbents in, this, in those economic areas not only have the amparo, and what they have now is that they have the amparo, they have la acción de inconstitucionalidad because it is related with right. the rights, and they have la cuestión de inconstitucionalidad because it's related with the powers of different bodies in, 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 in the government. Right. So what we know now is that we wanted Telmex to have less constitutional power in order to block policies of telecommunications in Mexico. But the paradox is that they now they have more, more powers yeah. that are in tr <laughs> to uh, block policies in this area, for example. I, I just, we're just, to make just, 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 just,
Sí. No, I, I just wanted to return to the, the point about that the judges are doing certain things and I, 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 I'm not denying that judges are doing these decisions and solving the contradictions and the problem is that they are changing all the time. That's what I call like the, you know, the inefficacies I talk about. It's not that you disregard what the Constitution, it's, it's in the way, it's, so it's not separate what you said from what I say, you know? So the problem is that you, you, you can solve this, but, but, but as the Constitution gives a, a lot of possible arguments, the, the, the court keeps changing and, and, and so, yeah, they, they are doing this, but at the, the democratic cost, be, beyond the empirical, because I forgot the second part of what I wanted to say before, even if empirically you have a court that can put order into that, the democratic cost of having the court determining not what the constitution means, but what the constitution is, in a way, because you talk about Yucatan, but then we are very far away from Yucatan, no? Uh, and luckily Yucatan is, Yucatan decided that the treaty part of the Bill of Rights trumps the constitutional, the traditional constitution. We are, we are on the other way around now. Yeah, yeah. So the traditional constitution trumps. So um, I don't know, if we do that that way, we don't even, we don't even notice this is reviewing, I don't know, politically, I think this is, this is horrible and it empowers a lot. The, the, the judges in this sense, um, comparing with what we can say, because we don't have many arguments to say this is bad, you know, because, because they consider, well, that, that's, a, that's a problem. Yeah. Sorry.